glad when they said unto me, come, let us go to the house of the Lord. What a delight it is to be here in your divine appointment, which is the media ministry of the Divine Jackson MD Ministries. And I'm Dr. Jackson. This class is Thursday school, which is Sunday school on a Thursday. We bless God. We study three days early, so we'll be ready for Sunday because we'll have these days to meditate on the word of the Lord. Well, here we are now in the first Sunday of April, April the 7th, 2024. This year is moving by, and our subject on today is faith of the persistent. Oh, this is an exciting lesson. Are you ready? <laughs> we bless God. We want you to know that these recordings are available on our social media platforms 24 hours a day on demand, asking you to tell at least two people, will you, this week about Thursday School, group text, group email, amen, spread the word. Listen while you're jogging. Listen while you're uh, cleaning in the home. Listen while you're working on your car. Glory to God. God is good. We bless God for the privilege to share his glorious words. Bless the Lord. And uh, we are uh, studying here ongoing on the theme of faith for these last few months. And it is rich indeed. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word and the privilege to study it. This is your doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. We bless you, great King. Teach us, make us, inform us, and inspire us, transform us, strengthen us, keep us, direct us, and anoint us for the purposes of the kingdom. This we pray in Jesus' name. Meet every need of my brothers, sisters, and friends. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, glory to God. In the book of Luke, chapter 5, verses 17 through 26. We'll be reading in the ESV, the English Standard Version, but we're going to have several verses that we'll be reading in the New King James Version. I hope you're ready with your Bible to turn some pages. Amen. If you're driving or something, you can look at them later. Amen. But there are some exciting supporting uh, scriptures and principles uh, that we want to look at on today. Well, this lesson uh, is about a miracle performed by our Lord, and of course, he did many. Luke chapter 5, verse 17 says, On one of those days, as he was teaching, circle the word teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there, all right, who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. They're from all over. And the power of the Lord was with him to heal. Wow. This is very significant because we see the audience that is here. The Lord Jesus is teaching. And there's an audience that has Pharisees. The teachers of the law, sometimes they were called scribes. Scribes taught the law, so did priests. Amen. And so various religious leaders are there. And they're from way up north in Galilee, down to the southern part of Israel in uh, Judea and from the holy city, Jerusalem. So however the word got out, there's a, an extensive crowd that's there. Glory to God. We're going to hear about the crowd in a minute. And so the Lord Jesus takes this wonderful opportunity, and he's teaching the truth. He's teaching the word. This is important of itself because sometimes when we have a crowd, we will turn our agenda to something that is self-serving. But Jesus stayed true to his mission, even though he had an awesome audience. Shall we say it as we would say in this day, he packed out the auditorium to overflow. But he stayed true to his mission. God help us to do the same. Jesus teaches the word of God. And while he's teaching, glory to God, the spirit of the Lord is there to heal. Now, the spirit of God can heal at any time. But there are sometimes the Spirit of God will move for a particular purpose at a particular time. God sovereignly, sometimes in a, in a uh, revival setting or in a Sunday morning worship, we're going to be Wednesday night Bible study, whatever. Sometimes the Spirit of God in particular, whether it may be healing or that night, many are filled with the Spirit or that particular time. Those that are uh, uh, broken hearts or sometimes you see family restorations, family after family. Children start coming home. Marriages start being renewed. Family restoration. Spirit of God may have a particular agenda at a certain time. We pray for anything and everything at any time. God gives us that purpose. So that's what you will. But we need to know that sometimes the Lord is 
in a particular way stirring. All of a sudden you'll see young people getting saved left and right. Um, so when God is doing something particular, we should take note. Well, at this particular time, and many of them, no doubt, not aware, but the Spirit of God was there to heal. Interesting. Now, they didn't have social media and so on, so there was no, uh, and the Lord doesn't always announce what he's going to do in advance, but we're about to hear about somebody who needs to be healed. Oh, he's going to be in the right place at the right time. Because some people on his behalf have committed themselves to get their friend to Jesus. Oh, glory to God. And you and I must do the same. Get our friends, neighbors, even our enemies, get them to Jesus. Oh, glory to God. So here's a powerful setting. And there's some uh, key principles here we must not miss. Let's look at these. And we're going to look at five scriptures that show us some powerful things about a connection. Look at this connection. Jesus is teaching the spirit of Christ. Christ Jesus is teaching and his very spirit is there to heal. This is important because we don't want to break the connection between truth and deliverance. Oh, glory to God. They go together. Some people have, they say, my ministry is healing. Praise God. There's a gift. Of, there's gifts of healing and so on. But don't fail to connect whatever your spiritual gift is. Don't fail to connect it with the truth. Preach, teach, along with whatever the giftedness is. Hallelujah. Because spiritual gifts are all different kinds. But the spiritual gifts, their ultimate purpose is that people hear the truth because it's the truth that will save them. Sometimes people can receive of your spiritual gift, but their soul is not so. The ultimate is the salvation of soul. Don't forget to preach and teach along with whatever your giftedness may be. Oh, glory to God. Truth and deliverance, they go together. So the preaching and teaching of the gospel must always be given a priority. How There's different ways of preaching and teaching. Sometimes it's behind a podium. Sometimes you're sitting on the ground. Everybody just like in a picnic setting. Either way, it's the truth. Walking by the way, whatever it is. True signs and wonders run with the truth. True signs and wonders, they accompany truth. This is important because the, the gospel is not about, uh, and signs and wonders are not about entertaining somebody or uh, catering to their fickle interests, empty curiosity. This is not a game because the Lord Jesus was called before Herod and uh, on the you know the night of, of Jesus' betrayal, he went to all these different trials. He was before Caiaphas and Annas, and they sent him to Herod. And Herod's like, you know, basically perform me one of these miracles that I've been hearing about. Jesus didn't do it because this isn't a game and this isn't entertainment. Jesus has been working miracles all along. Herod, if you wanted to see, you could have. Jesus didn't say those words. But the principle is that we're not entertainers. Signs and wonders are not to try to make people famous or to line pockets. The purpose, amen, the purpose is advancement of the kingdom of God. Oh, God, help us today. And so we need to look at some of the things that signs and wonders are for. Let's look at these verses. Let's begin with Acts chapter 4, verse 29 and 30. I have it marked here. Acts chapter 4. Verses 29 and 30. And I'm reading this in the New King James Version. It says, Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus Signs and wonders here would strengthen the faith and increase the boldness and the confidence of the believer. The, the, the disciples had just been beaten and suffered for the name of Christ. And they're saying, basically, Lord, refresh us and restore us and renew us and so that we can go forth with boldness and let there be signs and wonders. These things are going to further strengthen us as we go forth 
like that extra assurance the Lord God is with us and I'm on target and I'm doing the right thing. Lord, let signs and wonders be there for faith building and strengthening. Amen. Signs and wonders have a purpose. Look at St. John chapter 4 and verse 48. John 4 and 48. Again, this is King James, New King James Version. Then Jesus said to him, unless you, or some have the word people in there, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. Signs and wonders here are for the unbeliever in order for them to believe. So they're unbelievers and we want them to believe. So the signs and wonders prove the reality of the power of God. It backs up and affirm what has been said to them. Because usually there's preaching and teaching, amen. And then when God gives signs and wonder, now the, the unbeliever looks on and says, this thing must be real. What I heard must be true. Glory to God. So it's for the purpose of bringing sowing faith in the unbeliever. Amen. Now, there are different times when it's also for affirmation of a ministry. Look at Acts chapter 2 and verse 22. Acts 2 and 22. It says, men of Israel, hear these words. This is a, a Apostle Peter on the day of Pentecost. He's still uh, preaching his phenomenal sermon. He says, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. So God attested or affirmed or showed his approval on Jesus's ministry. He affirmed the ministry, signs, wonders, and miracles. Oh, blessed be God. Hallelujah. None of this is entertainment. It's all about building the faith, sowing faith into the heart of the unbeliever. It's strengthening the faith of the believer, and it's to affirm the ministry that it is indeed of God. That's one of the affirmations of ministry. Sometimes there isn't that type of a miracle. God uses other things that affirm a ministry, but this is one of them. Oh, blessed be God, the sign of one and miracle, because simultaneously it's stirring in the unbeliever and stirring in the believer as well. Ah, glory to God. So if there's not signs and wonders, something that you can say is physically, visibly miraculous, we cannot say that that ministry is not affirmed because the greatest miracle of all is not seen with these eyes. And that miracle is salvation in the soul. Amen. But it's beautiful when God does those extra uh, demonstrative phys physical things, but that's not the only affirmation of a ministry because some people chasing the incredible, are engaging in false signs, false wonders, and faked miracles, which is what we're going to look at now. There are false signs, wonders, and miracles. Last two verses, let's take a look at these. One of them is Matthew 24 and 24. This is uh, when the Lord Jesus is talking about the signs of the end times. Matthew 24, 24 says, for false Christs, Notice it's a small c. They're not real. For false Christs and false prophets will rise. And what's going to happen? They're going to show great signs and wonders. What? To deceive, if possible, even the elect. So these incredible signs and wonders and, and things, many of these, but these are things of deception. Hallelujah. False Christs, false prophets all this incredible thing going on, but it's about deception. Glory to God. And then lastly, let's look at 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 and 10. 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 and 10. Scripture says, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with, look what he comes with, all power, signs, and lying wonders. Things are not what they look like they are. Now, let me throw this in, darlings. Uh, sometimes, and I'm not saying that this is exactly that, but let me just mention, sometimes what magicians do, and they have magic shows, and what magicians do, their expertise is to make things seem like what they're not. 
Now, that principle, and I'm not saying that the one that does magician is, is, is this, a very type of a person. Now, of course, the Antichrist is a specific person, but I'm not saying that those that are magicians are all uh, specifically uh, after a spiritual deception and that kind of thing. But the principle is, are you with me? The principle is that a magician makes things look like one thing when it's something else. And here, it's a same thing because it's power, science, and they're lying wonders. It's not a real wonder, it's a lying wonder. It's made to look like one thing when it's really something else. Beware, because all of that is about deception. Lying and deception are married. Oh God, help today. Look at verse 10. And with all unrighteous deception among those who perish. Wow, but there's a reason. Because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved salvation from the truth. They rejected the truth and that made them easy victim and prey for the deceiver. God, help us to receive the truth so that we won't be made these ready prey and victim for the deceivers. Help us today. Oh, glory to God. Help me shout. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. Glory to God. Well, look at verse 18. Verse 18 says, and behold, some men were bringing on a bed a man who was paralyzed, and they were seeking to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. Oh, Jesus is the only hope. Look at this. It's good to have some friends that know Jesus. Who you're running with? If you're ever paralyzed by a circumstance, it might not be physical. If you're in trouble, do you have friends that will bring you to Jesus? Glory to God. That's the kind of friends we need. And these men got together. Their friend is on a bed. He can't get there himself. Sometimes we need somebody bring me to Jesus. Get me there. Glory to God, I don't seem to have the strength to get through, to come on through myself. I need somebody to help me. Hallelujah. This man had friends that said, we're getting our friend to Jesus. So they're bringing him on a bed and they're seeking to bring him and put him right before Jesus. Oh, glory to God. Now, this is significant because it is spiritually symbolic that we need to bring everybody to Jesus. Well, Jesus is not physically on earth now. So we can't physically bring them, like in this circumstance, on a bed or whatever circumstance, bring them to Jesus. So the way we bring them to Jesus is by the gospel, because the gospel is truth and Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the gospel. The book of St. Matthew, the first book of the New Testament, and the book of the first of the gospels, it's about Jesus. It starts with Jesus. Amen. Matthew opens with Jesus. The New Testament opens with Jesus. The Gospels open with Jesus. So whereas before we would bring people to Jesus, now we bring Jesus by way of the Gospel to them. <laughs> Take the Gospel to them. Amen. And that's how we bring them Jesus. Glory to God. Matthew, uh, Mark 16, 15. Go ye into all the world and preach the Gospel to every creature. Preach, witness, testify, teach, do whatever. Get the gospel to the world. Glory to God. Bless his name. Look at verse 19. So they're, they're bringing their friend to Jesus. Look at verse 19. But finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd. Oh, they went up on the roof and let down, let him down with his bed through the tiles or through the tiles of the roof right down in the midst before Jesus. Now, this brings us to a, a powerful point where we see that there are obstacles when we're trying to get people to Jesus. And just like they experienced physical obstacles, you and I are going to run into often spiritual obstacles, social obstacles, political obstacles, cultural obstacles, all kind of things to keep us from getting people to Jesus. Amen. But we are to persist, press in, and press through to get them to Jesus. 
Let's look at some of the obstacles they had. Number one, they had to carry him on a bed. He had to be carried on a bed. Wow, he was paralyzed, couldn't walk. Bible didn't say what distances was. How, long, how far did they have to carry him? Was it only like a couple few yards? Was it a few miles? But whatever the distance, they carried it and carried it. Whatever the weight was, they bore the weight. They recruited help, so we got enough of us. We got to get in there. Oh, so it takes planning, preparation. Sometimes you have to call in other help in order to help. Amen. That's a word for somebody. Sometimes you need help in order to help someone. Whatever we need, we got to get them to Jesus. And they carried him. That means that they bore the weight to get into the Lord. And sometimes we have to pray it through, work it through, help people through. And we have to bear the weight because they're not able to bear it themselves. Get them to Jesus. Oh, glory to God. And number two, they had to deal. Once they finally got there, there's a crowd. This opened up telling us people from Galilee and Judea and Jer Jerusalem, people from the north and south, they're all over. And there's a crowd on them. Houses full of people. We can't get in the door. So we have to deal with the crowd. Not only physically the crowd to get through them. But no doubt in the, the crowd became a distraction. Oh, no, we got to deal with the crowd. But also there were probably detractors saying, what are you all doing? How do you think you're getting in? I got here first. I'm in this spot. I'm not moving. So when we're trying to get people to Jesus, don't be surprised when there's distractions and detractors. Oh, God, help us to press on through. But our subject talks about perseverance, right? talks about persistence. So that's what they had. They had persistence, which means they were determined to see their friend delivered. They were determined that their friend would get a miracle. They had faith in Christ Jesus. Listen, if we get him to Jesus, we know he will be delivered and healed. All we got to do is get him to Jesus. So they had faith in Christ. They were determined that their friend would be delivered and they were committed to the well-being of their friend. Mm. That means something. Commitment, commitment. Lord, help us to be committed, to see to it, that with all our might and calling and help, we get the souls to Christ. Wow, that means something. So they had to carry the bed bear his load. They had to deal with the crowd, distractions and detractors. They had to be persistent, determined that he get his miracle, faith in Christ and commitment to their friend. Commitment to souls. Amen. It doesn't have to just be a personal friend, but there needs to be a commitment to souls where we're stirred about the necessity of the gospel, reaching everybody, everywhere with a heart of compassion. Glory to God. Lord, help us today. Amen. And what brought, what brings people to Jesus? And we might even look back in our old life, our own life. What brought us to Jesus? Hallelujah. And that is our Bible spot. Glory to God. Oh, let's talk about it. What brought you to Jesus? Let's look first at seven elements that are often involved in a part of the witness. And then we'll end with the preaching. The witness often draws them. The preaching brings them on through. Let's look quickly at these seven elements that are often involved in the witness. Number one is testimony. Somebody is testifying about what Christ has done in their life. Oh, glory, we've got to make known his deeds. Number two, miracles. We just spoke about how miracles, signs, wonders, and things of that nature can stir people to know the reality of Christ. Signs, wonders, and miracles cause people to say, there's real power behind this thing. So what they're saying must be true. That's why the preaching and the miracle going together. Number three, prayer. Pray for one another. Pray for salvation. Pray for deliverance. Pray for there to be a change and a breakthrough and the hand of God move. Pray. Glory to God. Prayer makes a difference. Number four is singing. Many of us have come in because we heard somebody singing. 
We felt the joy in the song and the power of it. And the words stirred our soul. That's why singing is so powerful. And of course, we're talking about gospel singing. People are singing a lot of things, but we want to sing the gospel, just like you could teach it and whatever. Put it in a song. Amen. There's inspirational music, which builds people's enthusiasm and excitement, and it can stir their emotions, but it may not point them to the Lord. Inspiration's good, but what about gospel music, gospel singing? Song, music is a powerful force. Many people hear the music, and then after they come, then they hear the lyrics, and the lyrics tell them about the Savior. Number five, an exemplary life, a life that is so inspiring. They learn so much about what righteousness is by seeing what it looks like every day in shoe leather, every day in the house, got to live right at home, every day in the job with our co-workers and wherever we are, family reunions, amen. What do we text about? What do we email about? What do we say on the phone? Is it an example? Is it an example? to inform and inspire others by Christ. Here's the question. Does our life cause people to be drawn closer to Christ? Or is our life causing people to go further from him? Help us, Lord. My, my, my. Number six, compel. Bible said, go, eat, go out in the highways and hedges. Go everywhere. Compel. Urge people. Beg people. Plead with them. Move upon them. You know, use your exhortation, compel them. Come, you got to come. Come to Jesus. And lastly, the restored by a comeback. Some have come, but they've drifted. And to them we say, come on back. God is a restore. As long as you're alive, it's not over. God's mercy is extended to you right now. And that's why you're still alive. If you haven't received Christ or you've drifted, come on back if you've drifted. If you've never received Christ, receive him now as your Lord and Savior. Admitting you're in sin, Lord, I want you to forgive me. I know Jesus, you died for me to pay the penalty for my sin. You died, but you rose, you're alive. I leave my old life, forgive me, and I will follow you. Take Jesus, follow him. Join a Bible, believe in church, and serve. The living God. Glory to God. So those seven elements of the witness. Now let's move to the uh, eight verses that highlight the preaching. So we need a witness that brings him in. The preaching brings him on through. Let's look at these verses. One, sin is real. Romans 3 and 23. Amen. Romans 3 and 23. King James Version. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Sin is real. Number two. Sin does have consequences. Romans 6 and 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, because sin has consequences. Number three, God loves us. Woo! God loves us. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. God loves us. Number four, his compassion toward us never ends. Lamentations 3, verses 22 and 23. Lamentations, I have it marked here. Let me read that to you. And this is in the new King James Version. Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Oh, my Lord, his compassions, they never fail. Glory to God. And number five, the Lord doesn't want any to be lost. Wow. Some say the Lord's not interested in me. I'm counted out. No, 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 no. The Lord does not want any to be lost. Second Peter chapter three and verse nine, New King James. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us. Long-suffering, long-suffering, long-suffering. Why? Not willing that any should perish, 
but that all should come to repentance. His compassions fail not, and he wants none to be lost. He wants none to be lost. Amen. Number six, judgment and eternity are real. Judgment and eternity, they are real. Revelation chapter 20, verses 12 through 15. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Verse 13, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. Verse 14, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life, they were cast into the lake of fire. That's because judgment and eternity are real. Number seven, Jesus is knocking at the door of your heart right now. He's knocking, asking for entry. Revelation 3, verse 20. Revelation 3, verse 20. Continuing in the New King James. Excuse me, continuing in the King James. Revelation 3, 20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with he, with, with him, basically eat with him, fellowship with him. I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. Jesus is knocking at the door of your heart right now. Just open the door and let him in. Wow, number eight, end it with number eight. Jesus is calling you right now. He's calling you, beckoning for you, inviting you. Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and look what's gonna happen, and you shall find rest unto your souls. Woo. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus is calling you right now. Wow, wow, wow. That's wonderful news. Where did he go? Well, continuing in our lesson, they have gone through all of these obstacles to get the, uh, their friend to Jesus. Now that they've gotten him to Jesus, we're in verse 20 of our lesson. And some wonderful things transpire. Verse 20 says, And when he saw their faith, Jesus saw their faith, he said, Man, your sins are forgiven. Wow. I thought faith, people say, is something that your physical eyes can't see. But the scripture in James is faith without works is dead. So faith, when it's real faith, it will produce activity. It will produce a response. And that response is visible. Jesus saw their faith in action. He saw their faith moving. And their faith made them put their friend on the bed and go the distance. And their faith made them endure the distractions and the detractors. And their faith made them climb on the roof. And their faith made them tear down the tile. Their faith made them let their friend down to get into Jesus at all costs. And Jesus saw it. Glory to God. And Jesus' response is, he forgave the man his sins. What? And that was the response. Look at verse 21. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to question, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? How did they reach such conclusion? The next line says it. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Uh -huh. And Jesus knows that. Verse 22. And Jesus perceived their thoughts. They didn't say it. They were thinking it. And the very fact that he knew what they were thinking, that alone should have told them, hmm, we're dealing with somebody here that's powerful because he knows what we're thinking. Glory to God. When Jesus perceived their thoughts, he replies to what they're thinking. <laughs> Glory to God. And he says to them, why do you question in your hearts? 
Why are you debating this matter in your hearts? And because he knew their thoughts. Psalm 139 talks about the fact that the Lord knows our thoughts. Let me read this to you. Verses 1 through 3 in Psalm 139. Uh, and this is in the New King James Version. Uh, the psalmist says, O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You understand my thinking before I get there. Far off. It hasn't even happened yet. I haven't thought it yet. But you already know what I'm going to think. Wow. Look at three. You comprehend my path and my lying down and you're acquainted with all my ways. We're not going to hide from the Lord. Wow. So Jesus knew his thoughts. Why? Because he's God. Oh, bless his name. So that's why. He knew their thoughts. Look at verse 23. So Jesus says, what's easier for me to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise up and walk? Mm -hmm. So I, Jesus is making it known, I've got the power to do both. And one is as easy for me as the other. Which is easier? Your sins are forgiven, rise and walk. And this is because when we're talking about sins being forgiven, and we're talking about physical illness, when man fell, when sin came, it came with a twofold problem. Man's soul fell into sin, and so the soul fell into brokenness. And his physical body of man fell into disease and brokenness. So a diseased soul and a diseased body, both happen. But the same God who heals disease of body, and he's been doing it all these Time in his ministry. They've all heard about these physical miracles. Jesus has taken them to the next level. You know I can heal the diseased body. I've been doing it all this time, all in my ministry. Now I'm letting you know. Oh, glory to God. I'm not only here about the natural world, but I'm here to heal the diseased soul. Woo! So I'm telling this man in your presence while the crowd is here, while the auditorium is packed. <laughs> can we talk about it? I'm going to not only heal the man's body, but I'm going to forgive his sins. Oh, glory to God. Glory to God. Jesus says to him, your sins are forgiven you. Why can he do it? Because Jesus is both God and his man. The scripture says there in Matthew 1 and 23, that they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Emmanuel, God is here with us. So God takes on human flesh, call his name Jesus. He is Emmanuel, God with us. Oh, glory to God. So Jesus says, I am God. That's why I can tell him to be healed. Oh, bless his name. Now they had a problem with it, but Jesus has the power. Amen. So whether it's easy to say, your sins are forgiven you or rise and walk. Verse 24, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. So Jesus spoke to the healing of his soul, priority one, sins forgiven. Then we turn to rise, take up your bed, and go home. My God, the healing of his body. How beautiful Jesus came. And in fact, not only is Jesus God, but he's the only one through whom we can receive the forgiveness of sins. If we turn to Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, there neither is there salvation in any other. There is no other name among under heaven given among men where by which we are saved. No other name under heaven among men, by which we are saved. Oh, bless his name. Jesus is the only way. Oh, bless his be his name. So, but the focus now, of course, is the soul. Because the soul is eternal. The body is only temporary. If the body doesn't get healed, it's temporary. But the soul is forever. Look at verse 25. And immediately, 
This man, he rose up before them, picked up what he had been laying on. Well, that's a message in itself. <laughs> he picked up the very bed, the bed that had carried him. Now that he's delivered, he's carrying the bed. Oh, glory to God. The bed that once carried him. Now he's carrying the bed. The, he picked up what he had been laying on and he went home glorifying God. Now notice the connection that happens in verse 26, our last verse. And amazement seized them all and they glorified God. And uh, they were filled with awe. And they're saying, we have seen extraordinary things today. But notice the connection in verse 25. He is glorifying. And as a result of him glorifying God, this incredible thing happened. Now in verse 26, they are glorifying God. Darlings, what God is doing in our lives, we need to give him the glory. And as a result of us giving God the glory, can't be all, you know, all in secret. Some of it's in secret in our prayer closet, in our private time, but some of it's glorifying. It's got to be public. Open our mouth, lift our hand, declare, make it known. Tell the story. Amen. Somebody needs to know that we're glorifying God so they can glorify God for what the Lord has done. If we never show it, never tell it, never make it known, how can they glorify God with us for the marvelous things he's done? Glory to God. And they said at the end of verse 26, we have seen extraordinary, miraculous, incredible things today. <laughs> and this miracle fuels the fire of the faith of witnessing to witness even more. The witness and the preaching, all of that, amen, it's necessary. It's necessary. Oh, glory to God. Let me end with this precious ones. Sometimes some persons uh, are disappointed or discouraged in terms of their physical health if they don't have physical health. But remember this, the focus of Christ, he came to heal the diseased soul and to heal the diseased body. He does both, but the priority is the soul because it's eternal. And we are going to get another body. Glory to God. We're going to read about that in just a moment. So everybody, watch this now, everybody that comes to Jesus gets the healing for the soul, 100%. The Bible says, Jesus says, I will, he that comes to me, I will in no wise cast him out. If you come to Jesus, everybody. He will receive us and we receive healing of the soul. The healing of the body might be partial or it might be complete. So the healing of the body may happen, it may not. But that's okay. Because when the soul has been healed, that disease healed, we've been saved. The healing of the diseased soul is salvation. When our soul is saved, we have eternal life whether this physical body is completely well or not. And we have the good news. Glory to God. If we look at, let's end with 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 gives us this beautiful uh, conclusion of what the Lord has done. Amen. And I have it marked here. I had it marked looking for my tab. You all excuse me. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting with verse 15. Glory to God. In fact, this entire chapter 15, um, a whole segment of it has to do with the resurrection. But verse 50 through 58, glory to God. The word of the Lord says, Now this I say, brethren, I'm reading in the New King James Version. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, this physical body, nor does corruption inherit in corruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. 
55. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, hell, or oh, Hades, or oh, grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. 57. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Keep on laboring for God. God bless you, my brothers, sisters, and friends. Remember this. The God of the Bible is real. Prepare for your divine appointment with him. It's coming. God bless you. Oh, yes, till we meet again.